Hello, my lovelies. Sorry for the delay. You know how Windows loves to do that wonderful automatic update thing? So it decided to do this in the middle of the night last night. And I sprinted out of bed because when that happens, it turns the screen on. It, I mean, just all sorts of hell breaks loose when Windows decides to do its automatic update. And so I dashed over to my computer quickly, which is, you know, right behind my bed, as you can see. And I hit the switch on my power strip so that the computer would not turn on and fry my eyes. Um, and then I forgot that it needed to update. Yeah, so when I turned on my computer 15 minutes early <laughs> to get ready to start the stream, it said, Windows is now updating. Please stand by. And it's like, there's no way to exit out of this. So, ah, ah. <laughs> so my apologies for being late. Hello, Lawrence. Hello, Logic. Hello, Different Gnome. Hello, Shaman. So glad you guys are here. Oh, my gosh. Technology. Don't we love it? <laughs> I've heard tell that technology is like a giant magnifying glass. It makes all things better, better, even more better. And it makes all things worse. Absolutely worse. So... We are starting off today with Jordan Peters, the Jordan and I can't talk because I have had a malfunctional day. So um, we are starting off with Jordan Peterson's biblical series, um, kind of you know matches up with his uh, book series, and um, yeah, yeah, should be a fun time. Even though I had an absolutely horrid day, um, horrible pain. Uh, weather front came through this afternoon. I mean, you could see the split in the sky. It's like, you know, this side's clouds, and then this side is sunny and blue, and there's that line, that frontal line you see running down the middle of it, and it's like, oh, boy, I'm in for a big one. So, um, yeah, I, oh, hello, Sam. Come on out. <laughs> Sam's food is in the closet so that Free Free doesn't get to it. But you want to come out? Come on out. Come on out. Yeah, come on out. That's a good boy. <laughs> he needs help. <laughs> come on out. There you go. That's a good boy. All right. So we have Doggy. And we have me. And we have you. Ah. Oh. And we have Jordan Peterson. So I will start this up. Um, we have no more doggy now. Hmm. Okay. But um, how many of you have actually watched the Jordan Peterson biblical series? Let, let's take a survey of the chat. Um, because, uh, yeah, I it, it actually took me a while to get through. It was one of those things where it's like I would watch it and then I would think and then I would go away and then I'd watch a little bit more. I pause it and I go away and I think. So, you know, if at any point I've got my um, iPad here, so I've got the chat running. Um, and, um, yeah, if, if you guys have a question, I will see it on my iPad sooner than I will see it in the chat on StreamYard. You've seen clips, different gnomes? Different gnome? Okay, great. So, um, yeah, let's get this party started. So here we go, and here we, no, no thanks YouTube, stop, stop advertising to me because I really don't care. <laughs> Let me know if that volume is good. Thank you all very much for coming. It's really shocking to me that we 
don't have anything better to do than the Tuesday night. <laughs> no, seriously, though, it, it is. I, I mean, you know, it's, it's, a, it's very strange in some sense that there's so many of you here to listen to a sequence of, psych, of lectures on the psychological significance of the biblical story. It isn't something I've wanted to do for a long time, but it still does surprise me that um, there's a ready audience for it. And, well, I, so that's good. So we'll see how it goes. And uh, I'll start with this, because this is the right question. The, the right question is, why bother doing this? And, and I don't mean, why should I bother doing it? Um, I have my own reasons for doing it, but you might think, well, why bother with this strange old book at all? And that's a good question. You know, um, it's a contradictory document that's been cobbled together over thousands of years. It's outlasted. That is a good question. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to oh, Lost Plain. Sorry. Movie. Uh, I clicked on the wrong tab there. This said May 2nd, 2017. Um, yeah, you may have seen this, Logic Rex. Um, I don't know. Let me look that up. Um, Bill C-16. So Bill C-16 started... When? No. Give me a wiki. All right. Bill C-16 was introduced in May 2016. So this was after Bill. Uh, this is May 2017. I'll, I'll jump back really quick. Let's see. We're at 140. So... This was uh, May 16, 2017. So this was almost a year after um, the Bill C-16. So let me see if I can get us back to 140. 117, 137, that's close enough. All right. So, yeah, this, this was a year after the whole Bill C-16 thing erupted. So, yeah. Uh, and Logic, you, you probably have seen this one. It's the first one in the series. And um, what's funny is he doesn't even get to into the Bible in this whole first lecture. It's, it's just basically a, a background um, into... Uh, you know, why the importance, the, the, the cultural significance of the Bible, and a lot of it I find absolutely fascinating. He says in here that it survived, um, you know, empires. This is a book that has survived empires. In fact, it survived many, many empires, if you think about it. Um, and so a book that survived that long, there's got to be something to it. You know, we, we, we venerate Shakespeare for the same reason. There's something to it um, that kind of speaks to all of us. And that's that's why these things, you know, if you remember what we talked about yesterday, um, you know, it's it's only those top hits of those top classical composers that have survived time. And it's those same small, very, you know, d distilled um, greatest hits that that survive to this day and are played by orchestras to this day so the same sort of thing exists with bible literature and a lot of the bible literature especially in the old testament is tens of thousands of years old so it's absolutely fascinating why these stories get preserved um you know because as a whole the human species is about storytelling you know, we tell a story about ourselves. We tell a story about the world. We tell a story about, you know, the greatest events in history, that sort of thing. So um, the, the fact that these stories got preserved and passed on and, you know, survive up into this day, 2,000 years later, at least in the case of the New Testament, thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, you know, earlier than that, 
for the Old Testament, you know, that really, really speaks to how much these stories resonate with us. And there's a couple of really cool gems in there. So um, I'll go ahead and continue with this. Over thousands of years, it's outlasted kingdoms, many, many kingdoms. You know, it's, it's, it's really interesting that it turns out that a book is more durable than, than stone. It's more durable than a castle. It's more durable than an empire. And, and that's really interesting, you know, that, that it's something in some sense so evanescent and be so long living. So there's that. That's kind of a mystery. I'm, I'm approaching this whole scenario, this, this, the biblical stories, as if they're a mystery, fundamentally, because they are. There's a lot we don't understand about them. <clears throat> we don't understand how they came about. We don't really understand how they were put together. We don't understand why they had such an unbelievable impact on civilization. We don't understand how people could have believed them. We don't understand what it means that we don't believe them now or, or even what it would mean if we did believe them. There, there's, and then on top of all that, there's the additional problem, which isn't specific to me, but is certainly relevant to me, that no matter how educated you are, you're not educated enough to discuss the psychological significance of the biblical stories. But I'm, I'm going to do my best. and. Partly because I want to learn more about them, and one of the things I've learned is that the best way to learn about something is to talk about it. And when I'm lecturing, I'm thinking, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to tell you what I know for sure to be the case, because there's lots of things I don't know for sure to be the case. I'm trying to make sense out of this, and I have been doing this for a long time. Now, you, know, you may know, you may not, that I'm an admirer of Nietzsche. Um, Nietzsche was a devastating critic of, I would say, dogmatic Christianity. Christianity as it was instantiated in institutions, I, I suppose. Although he, he's a very paradoxical thinker because, for example, one of the things Nietzsche said was that he didn't believe that the scientific... Know, absent the corruption and all of that. Did I just mute everything? Ever. And then the truth, the spirit of the truth. Ah. All right. Just speak up if I do that again, because I'm trying to mute my mic, but if it mutes the whole thing, that's terrible. All right. I need to close this. Where did I screw up? Because I, I didn't want to make noise of me moving. All right, let me try it from here. In institutions, I suppose, although he, he's a very paradoxical thinker. Can you hear him now? For example, one of the things Nietzsche said was that he didn't believe that the scientific revolution would have ever got off the Sorry about that, guys. If it hadn't been for Christianity and more specifically for Catholicism, because he believed that over the course of really a thousand years, the European mind, so to speak, had to train itself to interpret everything that was known within a single coherent framework. Coherent if you accept the initial axiom. Yeah, no, that was that was me muting my mic because I, I shifted my chair. Um, yeah, it shouldn't be a copyright copyright bot stepping in because uh, Jordan Peterson is wonderful about you know not doing copyright strikes about this stuff. 
which is one of the reasons why I started with him. Um, hopefully the Yale courses won't copyright strike me again. Uh, or not again, but you know, when we do them, because they're, they're the next ones that I want to cover. But yeah, that was my bad. I won't do that again. So sorry. Oh my gosh, I'm so embarrassed. A single coherent framework. So Nietzsche believed that that Catholicization of, of, of the phenomena of life and of history produced the kind of mind that was then capable of transcending the, its dogmatic foundations and then concentrating on something else, which in this particular case happened to be the natural world. And so Nietzsche believed that in some sense, Christianity died in its own hand. It, it had spent a very long period of time trying to attune people to the necessity of the truth, you know, absent the corruption and all of that, that's always part of any human endeavor. And then the truth, the spirit of the truth that was developed by Christianity turned on the roots of Christianity and everyone woke up and said something like, or thought something like, well, how is it that we came to believe any of this? Um, it's like waking up one day and noting, noting that you really don't know why you put a Christmas tree up, but you've been doing it for a long time and that's what people do. And, you know, there are reasons that Christmas trees came about, but the, what would you say, the ritual lasts long after the reasons have been forgotten. So this is an interesting point. And um, if you're a student of history, you'll notice that um, Christianity really died uh, kind of following World War II. You know, people, the church stepped in on different sides in World War II. And, um, you know, there are a lot of writings that ended up on the losing side. Uh, you know, there were a lot of churches that ended up on the losing side of World War II. So it was really, you know, the generation following World War II, the baby boomers, those guys are really the ones that didn't, you know, that, that grew up with this idea that, you know, church was responsible for a lot of evils. Um, and there was a, uh, what do you call it? Um, yeah. <laughs> just remember to take your tree down. That's awesome. Um, oh, Anna's in the house. Hello, Anna. Um, yeah, it's it's much more effective watching it with someone. And I'm, I'm sure that it'll take us a while because it took me a while even to get through this. And sometimes I had to go back and, and rewatch and things like that. Um, but yeah, it's it's one of those funny things where it's like it takes a generation for traditions to die really, because if you're in the generation that performed the traditions, you know, it's something that's very hard to let go of. Um, and so it was really the, the baby boomers, they had a resurgence, you know, like with Jesus Christ Superstar, Joseph and the Te Technicolor Dreamcoat, all that stuff in the 70s. I remember growing up in that um, revival. That's what they call it. They call it a revival. So um, I grew up in the 70s revival, and but there was still sort of this sputtering out of Christianity where it was like, you know, why do we believe in this weird sky daddy sort of thing? Um, and why do we pray and, and why do we do all this stuff? And, and it was much, much stronger in my, my grandparents' generation. But even then, you know, my grandparents, grandmother, uh, my grandfather died on my father's side before I was born. Um, you know, on my mother's side, both my grandparents, they weren't very religious either. So it was pretty much World War II that kind of killed the um, very dogmatic belief in Christianity in the United States. In Europe, it lasted much longer. I mean, like if, if you go to uh, Germany during Christmas time or anything like that. Um, <laughs> no, I was, I was way too young for bell bottoms. So, um, I didn't get to wear those. I was, I was just a little kid. Um, so, but I did, you know, wear, you know, um, just funky, you know, early, uh, Sesame street type stuff. So, um, that was kind of the generation that I was in. I was born in 73. So, um, Yuri Bezmenov says it takes 15 to 20 years to change a country. Right. Which is about 20 years is about a generation. 
Um, so, you know, you have the, the, the people really questioning the church in World War II, uh, the end of World War II, um, you know, that generation kind of eschewed the church and, and didn't so much hang on to it. Then 20 years later, you get the resurgence of Christianity, the revival of Christianity in the 70s. 20 years later after that, you get the 90s. 20 years later after that, 2010. So, you know, there are these, these sputterings and spurts and sort of things. But especially in the United States, it's kind of taken longer than that. The generations have kind of grown because people aren't having, because I remember in high school, kids getting married right out of high school. You know, if, if you were sort of lower class um, in St. Louis in the 1990s, getting married at 18 was not that big of a deal, especially if you were Catholic, you know, especially if you were Italian, you know, that sort of thing. Um, those sort of communities got married at 20, whereas the more upper crust societies, you got married at 30 and you had your first kids at 30. So you know, middle class, upper middle class, you waited until after college to get married um, or you got married in grad school or sometime thereabout and you had kids in your 30s. So, you know, Yuri Bezmenov is really, you know, based off of, um, you know, the, the whole uh, shorter generations that are more seen outside of the United States. But he is right. He, it, I mean, Yuri Bezmenov is an absolute genius. So, but anyway... Let's continue with Jordan. So now Nietzsche, although he was a critic of Christianity and also a champion of, of its disciplinary capacity, because you see the other thing that Nietzsche believed was that it was not possible to be free in some sense unless you, unless you had been a slave. And, and by that he meant that you don't go from childhood to full-fledged adult individuality you go from childhood to a state of discipline, which you might think is akin to slavery, to self-imposed slavery, that, that would be the best scenario where you have to discipline yourself to become something specific before you might be able to reattain the generality that you had as a child. And he believed that Christianity had played that role for Western civilization. Um, but in the late 1800s, he announced that God was dead, and you often hear of that <clears throat> as something triumphant. But for Nietzsche, it wasn't because he was too nuanced a thinker to be that simple-minded. See, Nietzsche understood that, and this is something I'm going to try to make clear, is that we, there's, there's a very large amount that we don't know about the structure of experience, that we don't know about reality. And, we have our articulated representations of the world. And then you can think of outside of that, there are things we know absolutely nothing about. And there's a buffer between them. And those are things we sort of know something about. And we don't know them in an articulated way. Here's an example. You know, sometimes you're arguing with one of your, someone close to you and they're in a bad mood, you know, and uh, they're being touchy and unreasonable. And you keep the conversation up and maybe all of a sudden they, you know, they get angry or maybe they cry. And then when they cry, they figure out what they're angry about. And it has nothing to do with you, even though you might have been what precipitated the argument. You know, that's an interesting phenomenon as far as I'm concerned, because it means that people can know things at one level without being able to speak what they know at another. And so in, in some sense, the thoughts rise up from the body and they, they do that in moods and they do that in images and they do that in actions. And we have all sorts of ways that we understand before we understand in a fully articulated manner. And so we have this articulated space that we can all discuss. And then outside of that, we have something that's more akin to a dream that we're embedded in. And it's an emotional dream that we're embedded in. And that's based at least in part on our actions. And I'll, I'll describe that later. And then outside of that is what we don't know anything about at all. And in that dream, that's where the mystics live. And that's where the artists live. And they're the mediators between the absolute unknown and the things we know for sure. And you see, what that means in some sense is what we know is established on a form of knowledge that we don't really understand. And that if those two things are out of sync, so you might say if our articulated knowledge is out of sync with our dream, then we become 
dissociated internally. We think things we don't act out and we act out things we don't dream and that produces a kind of sickness of the spirit and, and that sickness of the spirit, it, see, it, its cure is something like an integrated system of belief and representation. And then people turn to things like ideologies, which I regard as parasites on an underlying religious substructure to try to organize their thinking. And then that's a catastrophe. And that's what Nietzsche, Nietzsche foresaw. You see, he knew that when we knock the slats out of the base of Western civilization by destroying this representation, this, this God ideal, let's say, that we would destabilize and move back and forth violently between nihilism, let's say, and the extremes of ideology. He was particularly concerned about radical left ideology, you know, and believed and predicted this in the late 1800s, which is really an absolute intellectual tour de force of staggering magnitude. All right, I'm going to pause it right there. Do you guys haven't uh, heard of Gad Saad? Um, he's an, a wonderful man. Uh, he's a, a Canadian professor similar to Jordan Peterson, and he's written the book, The Parasitic Mind, uh, I, I recommend it to everyone. That's that's one of the ones that I wanted to go in the book club is The Parasitic Mind by Gad Saad. Uh, and he talks about these sort of um, mind parasites that the leftist ideology, you know, has, has really created um, and, and is destroying this current generation. So... Um, uh, different Gnome asks... Uh, I. Wow, I thought it was a generation was lost abstinence only education. Though I grew up in the Bible Belt, they probably held out longer. Um, and um, I, I mean, I grew up in the Bible Belt too. I grew up in Missouri, so um, the um, it was abstinence was lost when birth control first came out in the '60s. I believe. Um, and that's when, you know, women were no longer tied to this biological process and the whole, you know, summer of free love and everything like that really came out of the, um, you know, the idea of birth control. If, if you weren't going to get a woman pregnant, then why not have free love? You know, what was wrong with that? Well, a lot of things were wrong with that, you know, as, as we've discovered. Um, but yeah, that was, um, that was, you know, back, you know, my mother's generation. So, you know, um, yeah, the, the, these things, these things fluctuate and, and generations are not always clearly defined. Um, but yeah, uh, traumatic events and, and stuff like that will will set off these sort of things. So the late 60s, early 70s, um, and yeah, Taylor's right, plus plan, pan, planned parenthood. Um, you know, if you could get an abortion, um, you know, it, it wasn't such a, 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 but I do remember like the, the first girl to get pregnant in my generation, she was actually in junior high school. Um, and then there was a, a big scandal. We had the whole, um, what was it? The Sting song, um, Don't Stand So Close to Me. We actually had one of my history teachers married one of his students. They were both Catholic. And um, apparently he got her pregnant. Um, but, you know, she was 17, whatever, old enough. Um, but I mean, like back in those days, you know, the, the younger, you know, 15 was considered pretty much the age of consent. Um, even though in the law, it said much older. Um, but like, you know, 17, 18 being considered a full adult. I mean, if you watch the movie, um, oh, uh, it's a wonderful life. He's like 23 and he already has like five kids. Um, yeah, but he's considered a full fledged adult at 23. And that blew my mind when I heard it. Cause I'm like, Oh my gosh, you would never consider a 23 year old, a full fledged adult these days. You'd still consider them pretty much a kid. You, you're not a full fledged adult until you hit your thirties. You know, it's like that 
whole Timothy Leary thing. Don't trust anybody over 30. Well, that's why, you know, because that's the, the growth hormone cuts out when you're 25 and it slowly disappears to the time that you hit your 30s. And that's when your brain has really fully matured. So, um, yeah, and, and you're absolutely right, Taylor. Too many people see these things as tools for women, but don't realize the population control ideas behind it. Yeah, Sanger was an absolute eugenicist. But then again, most people were, were eugenicists back in those days. Um, you know, it's only... Uh, you know, because it was a very agrarian life and you knew that you bred your best bull with, you know, the, the females to make the best next generation. So that whole idea of breeding and all of that kind of stuff, I mean, it, it ties into everything. So, yeah, we're, we're performing experiments on ourselves by doing these sort of things. And we don't know what the outcome is going to be. Uh, and it's not always going to be for the good. So, yeah, that's, that's, we're, we're doing scary things with ourselves, folks. But, uh, yeah, let's get back to, uh, Jordan. Cause, um, yeah, it's, it's really fantastic. The idea that, you know, Nietzsche was able to come up with these ideas about the destruction of, you know, Western civilization back in the 1800s. I mean, he saw this 200 years you know, before we're dealing with it now. And so a lot of these ideas take a long time to come into fruition. So absolute to it. Nietzsche is fabulous. I love Nietzsche. Nietzsche is peachy. <laughs> predicted that in the 20th century that hundreds of millions of people would die because of the replacement of these underlying dreamlike structures with this rational rational but deeply incorrect representation of the world and you know we've been oscillating back and forth between left and right in some sense ever since and, you know with some good sprinkling of nihilism in there in despair in some sense that's the situation of the modern western person and in, in, increasingly of people in general you know i think part of the reason that islam has its backup with regards to the west to such a degree i mean there's many reasons and not all of them are valid that's for sure but one of the reasons is that, you know, they, they being still grounded in a in a in a dream, let's say, they can see that the rootless, questioning mind of the West poses a tremendous danger to the integrity of their culture. Now, and it does. I mean, Westerners, us, we undermine ourselves all the time with our searching intellect, and I'm not complaining about that. You know, I mean, it, it, there isn't anything easy that can be done about it, but but it's still. It's still a, a sort of a fruitful catastrophe. And, you know, it, it has real effects on people's lives. It's not some abstract thing, you know. I mean, lots of times when, when I've been treating people for depression, for example, or anxiety, they have existential issues, you know. It, it's not just some psychiatric condition. It's, it's not just that they're capped off of normal because their brain chemistry is faulty, although, you know, sometimes that happens to be the case. It's that... They are overwhelmed by the suffering and complexity of their life, and they're not sure why it's reasonable to continue with it. You know, they, they can feel the terrible negative meanings of life, but are skeptical beyond belief about any of the positive meanings. I had one client who was a very brilliant artist, and as long as he didn't think, he was fine, you know, because he'd go and create, and he was really good at being an artist. He just, you know, he had that personality that was continually creative and quite brilliant, although he was self-denigrating. But as soon as he started to think about what he was doing, then, you know, the, the it's like a, it's like a drill or a saw or something like that. He saw the branch off that he was sitting on because he'd start to criticize what he was doing, even the utility of it, even though it was sort of self-evidently useful. And then he would be, then it would be very, very hard for him to even motivate himself to create. So I don't know what you mean by this different noun. Those thoughts are coming back with Chinese super soldiers. First off, that's kind of a myth. Chinese super soldiers, give me a break. Uh, yeah, the, the, you actually have to pay your way to get into the Chinese military. So it's only those people that are rich enough um, who get in. And then, you know, um, yeah, so the Chinese super soldier is a myth. Uh, it forces us to decide 
if we should do it, keep up the military, or if that's the hill we die on. Well, you always got to keep up the military because if you don't, you get invaded. Uh, it's just that simple. And a lot of people forget that uh, the United States is not just, you know, the continental boundaries. It's the United States and the seven seas. You know, after the British were defeated in World War II, it was the Americans that took up the patrol of the seven seas to keep them open for international trade and things like that. So, you know, our Navy has been super important for the last, you know, 80 years, as it were. So if you want to expand on that a little bit more, um, I'll try and get into it. He always struck me as a good example of, of the consequences of having your rational intellect divorced in some way from your being, divorced enough so that it actually questions the utility of your being. And it's not a good thing. It's, it's not a good thing. And it's really not a good thing because it manifests itself not only in individual psychopathology, but also in social psychopathology. And that's this proclivity of people to get tangled up in ideologies, which, which I really do think of as, as they're like, they're like crippled religions. That's the right way to think about them. They're like religion that's missing an arm and a leg, but can still hobble along. And it, it provides a certain amount of security and group identity, but it's, it's warped and twisted and demented and bent and, it's a parasite on something underlying that's rich and true. And, and that's really true about the left. Uh, if you look at how they do, um, you know, uh, the green movement is very much a religion. Um, the, um, uh, the, the communistic movement, communism, the state becomes a religion, that kind of thing. So um, that's that's kind of what we're seeing today is that people have abandoned religion, but we all sort of have this biological need for religion, this psychological need for religion, um, you know, because there's so much about the world that we don't understand. Science can't answer it all. You know, medicine can't answer it all. Um, our, our different, you know, computers can't answer it all. You know, technology does not answer it all. And, but, but in getting rid of religion, we have to replace it with something else. So we replace it with these ideologies. And these ideologies are just absolutely broken. Um, yeah, uh, Taylor, exactly. Believe in the science over God. Um, and, and it, do, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. You know, science is constantly evolving. And, and the idea of settled science is just such a BS concept. There's no such thing as settled science. Science is always changing. There's nothing that's ever settled in science. So all of these sort of leftist ideas that they have are, are, are warped, are crippled, are not sufficient to deal with all the problems uh, that we have. Um, and, and you're absolutely spot on. The theology of despair. Yeah, like the whole story of the uh, artist who, who was, you know, incredibly creative and, and the creativity was self-explanatory, but he'd saw off his own branch in getting too critical about it. Um, you know, you, you begin to question, you know, why am I here? And if you don't have, oh, I'm here because I'm a child of God or some sort of theory like that behind it, you know, what's the point? Um, American Nacho says it's all theoretical. Right, right. I mean, that, and that's what's so amazing about the Bible is that you, you get these stories that are tens of thousands of years old. And so they've really been um, distilled, uh, you know, at people watching one another over thousands and thousands of years. Um, yeah, <laughs> American Nacho adds on, which is just a fancy way of saying our best guess. So, yeah. Um, and then Taylor says, all the left ideas or theories 
is putting faith in mankind. And that's not a good place to, to place faith. You know, it's, um, there was a great song and I can't remember who it's by. Um, but it was don't place faith in human beings, human beings of butterfly wings. Uh, and I, I always love that song because it's like, yeah, if we try and rely on our own knowledge, which is actually a, a, a biblical saying, you know, to, to lean on our own knowledge, that, that's not good uh, because we don't know enough. I mean, of all the things in the universe, we have barely scratched the surface of what we understand. You know, the theory of dark matter, which lasted for, you know, pretty much a decade or so, um, it is, is being proven absolutely wrong. And it's all come down to stellar dust and other things. And so, you know, science is constantly changing and grappling with itself. And, you know, what was considered, you know, like I watched a movie last night um, on the creation of the Oxford Eng English Dictionary. And it was back when they thought that, you know, the, the different indentations of your skull could tell you something about the psychological disposition of a person. And we know that's just humbug now, you know, that, that that's just absolutely malarkey. Um, and it's actually the inner structures of the brain that can tell us psychologically about somebody, you know, but they didn't have MRIs back then. So how the hell could they know? Um, Logic Rex says, in the Bible, it doesn't doesn't it say something to the effect of man was never supposed to rule over man? I'm not sure about that. I mean, because, you know, they had, you know, kings and stuff like that. But you were always supposed to put sort of a higher understanding in God that that man is not just the pinnacle, that there is something beyond that that is higher than us, that is wiser than us, you know, and that sort of rules over all creation. So uh, Anna says, well, that makes me feel better, especially knowing the people on the left mock Christianity and God. Oh, they absolutely do. Um, and I mean, you, you deal with any of the atheists on Twitter and you, so, you, you learn all their arguments because they have very, very few arguments. A lot of them haven't thought it all the way through. They're just kind of using it to justify their own point of view. So like, you know, they call God the sky daddy and things like that. I mean, you know, they try and trivialize it as much as possible. Whereas if you were really an intellectual scholar, you know, you would be willing to look at these things and then debate them. You want to steel man an argument, not straw man an argument. So um, and yeah, the left really just a lot of it comes down to they feel that the Christian religion is very judgmental. Um, you know, it's, it's very rigid as far as its dictates on behavior, you know, things about premarital sex, things about gay sex, things about transvestism, you know, things about, um, you know, transsexualism, all that kind of thing. And they don't understand because they haven't actually studied it. I mean, half of them haven't even read the Bible. Um, and they don't understand that why ancient civilizations came to these conclusions. And they don't think about the fact that this was before they understood, you know, STDs or anything like that. This was before they understood how birth e even happened. I mean, it, they used to believe that it was the man's seed that created life. So if you had an impotent male you know, that, that, you know, it, it had nothing to do with the female, uh, you know, just weird ideas, weird ideas, because, you know, the way that seeds work in agriculture, you plant a seed, it, the plant grows from the seed. And it wasn't the idea that you needed the merger of both and that it could be the woman's fault or the man's fault, you know, depending and all this other stuff. So, and then different gnome says, but wasn't King David controversial? And before they came, followed religious leader before the Jews wanted a king. Um, I'm not sure about that. Um, I know that there was, um, you know, there, and, and we'll get to this when we get to the Yale courses about um, the, the differentiation between the religious leaders and the secular leaders who weren't entirely secular, you know, but, but in that they were political leaders rather than 
um, uh, you know, purely religious scholars or that kind of thing. But they, the, the Jews at the beginning were very, very tribal. So, you know, you would have your tribe and, and you lived in a tent and you didn't have established cities and things like that. So uh, Anna says, it's fine if people don't want to believe in God, but I don't think it means they need to go out of their way to mock my faith, yet they do. That is out of fear. That's a lot of fear talking there. Um, you know, it's, they, they think themselves intellectually superior because they're not trapped in this ancient way of believing in religion. And they think you're silly for believing in God. But if you, you know, if, uh, and it was something that my stepbrother said to me, you know, and it was because he was, he was raised middle class sort of thing. He, you know, went to college. He should have gone to officer candidate school, but he actually ended up as an enlisted Marine, which is a much different crowd. And if you're in that crowd, those people think that the intellectuals are silly for not believing in God. Um, and I got to say, I was on both sides of this. I mean, like, but for me, it was very much rooted in 12 step stuff because I started that when I was 19. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I understood the utilitarian value of having a higher power and not leaning on, leaning on my own stuff and, and just having a concept of a God and fate. And, you know, a lot of people call it the universe and they talk to the universe sort of thing, but they have a hard time doing the old Christian thing of, of saying that that's God, um, which I understand because there's a lot of abuse that happens in the church and that sort of thing. So, so there are a lot of reasons, personal reasons that people have for rejecting it. Um, you know, but on the other hand, just to think that you're intellectually superior because you don't believe in God, that's a mistake. And that's a big mistake, which we will find out more with Jordan Peterson. So let's get back to him. Oh, why did the screen do that? No, I want it like that. There we go. Okay. That's how it looks to me anyways. And, and so... So I think it's very important that we sort out this problem. Um, I think that I think that there isn't anything more important that needs to be done than that. I've, I've thought that for a long, long time, uh, probably since the early '80s, uh, when I started looking at the psych the role that belief systems played in regulating psychological and social health, um, because they, you can tell that they do that because of how upset people get if you challenge their belief systems. It's like, why the hell do they care exactly? What difference does it make if, if all of your ideological axioms are 100% correct? Like, people get unbelievably upset when you, when you poke them in the axioms, so to speak. There you and go, it, Anna. It, isn't, it is not by any stretch of the imagination obvious why. You know? But there's some, it's like there's a fundamental truth that they're standing on. It's, it's it's like they're on a raft in the middle of the ocean and you're starting to pull out the logs, you know, and they're afraid they're going to fall in and drown. It's like drowning what? And what are the logs protecting themselves, protecting them from? And why are they so afraid to, to move beyond the confines of the ideological system? And these are not obvious things. So I've been trying to puzzle that out for a very long time. And I've, I've done some lectures about that that are on YouTube. Most of you know that. And, some of what I'm going to talk about in this series, you'll have heard if, if you've listened to the YouTube videos, but you know, I'm trying to hit it from different angles. And so, okay, so Nietzsche's idea was that human beings were going to have to create their own values, essentially. Now he understood that we had bodies and that we had motivations and emotions, like he was a romantic thinker in some sense, but way ahead of his time because he knew that our capacity to think wasn't some free floating soul, but was embedded in our physiology, constrained by our emotions, shaped by our motivation, shaped by our body. He understood that, but he still believed that the only possible way out of the problem would be for human beings themselves to become something akin to God and to create their own values. That was that, and he thought that the person, he talked about the person who create their own values as the overman or the superman, and that was one of the 
parts of Nietzschean philosophy that the Nazis, I would say, took out of context and used to fuel their you know, superior man ideology. So, and we know what happened with that. That didn't seem to turn out very well, that's for sure. And see, I also spent a lot of time reading Carl Jung. And it was through Jung and also Jean Piaget, who's a developmental psychologist, that I started to understand that our articulated systems of thought are embedded in something like a dream, <clears throat> and that that dream is informed in a complex way by the way we act. So, you know, we act out things we don't understand all the time. And if that wasn't the case, then we wouldn't need a psychology or a sociology or an anthropology or any of that, because we would be completely transparent to ourselves. And we're clearly not. So we're much more complicated than we understand, which means that the way that we behave contains way more information than we know. And part of the dream that surrounds our articulated knowledge has been extracted as a consequence of us watching each other behave and telling stories about it for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, extracting out patterns of behavior that characterize humanity and trying to represent them partly through imitation, but also through drama and mythology and literature and art and all of that to represent what we're like so that we can understand what we're like. And that process of understanding is what I see unfolding, at least in part, in the biblical stories. And it's it's halting and partial and awkward and contradictory and, and all of that, which is one of the things that makes the book so complex. But I see in it the struggle of humanity to arise, to rise above its animal forebears, say, and to become conscious of what it means to be human. And that's a very difficult thing because we don't know who we are, what we are, where we came from, or any of those things. And, you know, the light life is an unbroken chain going back three and a half billion years. It's an absolutely unbelievable thing. Every single one of your ancestors reproduced successfully for three and a half billion years. It's absolutely unbelievable. We rose out of the dirt and the muck, and here we are, conscious but not knowing. And we're trying to figure out who we are. And a story that we've been telling, or a set of stories that we've been telling for 3,000 years seems to me to have something to offer. And so when, when I look at the stories in the Bible, I do it, I would say, in some sense, with the beginner's mind. It's, it's a mystery, this book, how the hell it was made, why it was made, why we preserved it, how it happened to motivate an entire culture for 2,000 years and to transform the world. Like, what's going on? How did that happen? It's by no means obvious. And one of the things that bothers me about casual critics of religion is that they don't take the phenomena seriously. And it's a serious phenomena. I mean, not least because people have the capacity for religious experience and no one knows why that is. I mean, you can induce it reliably in all sorts of different ways. You can do it with brain stimulation. You can certainly do it with drugs. There's especially the psychedelic variety. They produce uh, intonations of the divine extraordinarily Regularly, people have been using drugs like that for God only knows how long, 50,000 years, maybe more than that, to produce some sort of intimate union with the divine. It's like we don't understand any of that when we discovered the psychedelics in the late 60s. It shocked everybody so badly that they were instantly made illegal and abandoned in terms of research for like 50 years. And it's no wonder because who the hell expected that? Nobody. Now, now, Jung was a student of Nietzsche, as you see, and he was also, I would say, a very astute critic of Nietzsche. He was educated by Freud, and Freud, Freud, I suppose, in some sense, started to collate, collate the information that we had pertaining to the notion that people lived inside a dream. You know, it was Freud who really popularized the idea of the unconscious mind. And we, we take this for granted to such a degree today that we don't understand how revolutionary the idea was. Like with, what's happened with Freud is that we've taken all the marrow out of his bones, so to speak, and left the husk behind. And you know, now when we think about Freud, we just think about the husk because that's everything that's been discarded. But so much of what he discovered is part of our popular conception now, including the idea that your perceptions and your actions and your thoughts are all, um, what would you say, informed and, and shaped by unconscious motivations that are not part of your voluntary control. And that's a very, very strange thing. It's one of the most unsettling things about the psychoanalytic theories, because the psychoanalytic theories are something like, you're a loose collection of living sub-personalities, each with its own set of motivations and 
perceptions and emotions and rationales, all of that. And you have limited control over that. So you're like a plurality of, 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 of internal personalities that's loosely linked into a unity. You know that because you can't control yourself very well, which is one of Jung's objections to Nietzsche's idea that we could create our own values. So Jung didn't believe that, especially not after interacting with Freud, because he saw that human beings were affected by things that were deeply, deeply affected by things that were beyond their conscious control. And no one really knows how to conceptualize those things. You know, the cognitive psychologists think about them in some sense as computational machines. And the ancient people, I think, thought of them as gods, although it's more complex than that. Like rage would be a god. Mars, the god of rage, that's the thing that possesses you when you're angry. You know, it has a viewpoint and it, 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 it says what it wants to say. And that might have very little to do with what you want to say when you're being sensible. And it doesn't just inhabit you, it inhabits everyone and it lives forever and it even inhabits animals. And so it's this transcendent psychological entity that inhabits the, the body politic like, like a thought inhabits the brain. That's one way of thinking about it. Very strange way of thinking, but it certainly, it certainly has its merits. And so, and those things, well, in some sense, those are deities, although it's not that simple. And so Jung, Jung was, got very interested in dreams and started to understand the relationship between dreams and myths because he would see in his clients' dreams echoes of stories that he knew because he was deeply read in mythology. And then he started to believe that the dream was the birthplace of the myth and that there was a continual interaction between the two processes, the dream and the story, and storytelling and well you know you tend to tell your dreams as stories when you remember them and some people remember dreams all the time like two or three a night i've had clients like that and they often have archetypal dreams that have very clear mythological structures i think that's more the case with people who are creative by the way especially if they're a bit unstable at, at the time because the dream tends to occupy the space of uncertainty and to concentrate on fleshing out the, the unknown reality before you get a real grip on it. So it's like the dream is the birthplace of thinking. That's a good way of thinking about it. And so because it's the birthplace of thinking, it's not that clear. It's doing its best to formulate something. That was Jung's notion, as opposed to Freud, who believed that there were sensors, internal sensors that were hiding the dream's true message. That's not what Jung believed. He believed the dream was doing its best to, ex to express a reality that was still outside of fully articulated conscious comprehension. It was, because you think, look, a thought appears in your head, right? That's obvious, bang, it's, it's nothing you ever ask about, but what the hell does that mean? A thought appears in your head. What kind of ridiculous explanation is that? You know, it's, it just doesn't help with anything. Where does it come from? Well, nowhere, it just appears in my head. Okay, well, that's not a very sophisticated explanation as it turns out, you know? and. So you might think that those thoughts, thoughts that you think, well, where do they come from? Well, they're often someone else's thoughts, right? Someone long dead, that might be part of it. Just like the words you use to think are utterances of people who've been long dead. And so you're informed by the spirit of your ancestors. That's one way of looking at it. And your motivations speak to you, and your emotions speak to you, and your body speaks to you. And it all does all that, at least in part, through the dream. And the dream is the birthplace of the fully articulated idea. They don't just come from nowhere fully fledged, right? They have a developmental origin and, and God only knows how, how, how lengthy that origin is. Even to say something like, I am conscious, you know, that's taken, chimpanzees don't say that. You know, it's been 7 million years since we broke from chimpanzees, something like that from the common ancestor. You know, they have no articulated knowledge at all. They have very little self-representation in some sense and very little self-consciousness and that's not the case with us at all and we had to painstakingly figure all of this out during that you know seven million year voyage and i think some of that's represented and 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 captured in some sense in these ancient stories which i believe were part of especially the oldest stories in genesis which is the stories we're going to start with that, that they were that 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 some of the archaic nature of the human being is encapsulated in those stories, and it's very, very instructive as far as I can tell. I can give you just a quick example. You know, there's an idea of sacrifice in, 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 in the Old Testament, and it's pretty barbaric, you know. I mean, 
the story of Abraham and Isaac is a good example of that because Abraham is called on to actually sacrifice his own son, which doesn't really seem like something that a reasonable God would ask you to do, right? The, the God in the Old Testament is frequently cruel and arbitrary and demanding and paradoxical, and which, which is one of the things that really gives the book life because it wasn't edited by a committee, you know, a committee that was concerned with, with uh, not offending anyone, that's for sure. <laughs> so... So Jung believed that the dream was the birthplace of thought. And I've been extending that idea because one of the things I wondered about deeply was, you know, you have a dream and then someone interprets it. And you can argue about whether or not an interpretation is valid, just like you can argue about whether your interpretation of a novel or movie is valid, right? It's a very difficult thing to determine with any degree of accuracy. It counts in part for the postmodern critique. But... My observation has been that people will present a dream and sometimes we can extract out real useful information from it that the person didn't appear to know, you know, and, and they get a flash of insight. And to me, that's a marker that we stumbled on something that unites part of that person that wasn't united before. It pulls things together, which is often what a good story will do or sometimes a good theory. You know, things snap together for you. And there's a little, little light goes on and, that's one of the markers that I've used for accuracy in, in dreams. And I know in my own family, uh, when, when I was first married, you know, I'd have fights with my wife, arguments about this and that. And uh, I'm fairly hot-headed, and so I'd get all puffed up and, you know, agitated about, about whatever we were arguing about. And she'd go to sleep, which is really annoying. It's so annoying. <laughs> Because I couldn't sleep, right? I was like chewing off my fingernails and she'd be like sleeping peacefully beside me. It's like <laughs> maddening. So, but often she'd have a dream, you know, and, and then the next morning she'd discuss it with me and then we could unravel what was at the bottom of our argument. And that was unbelievably useful, even though it was extraordinarily aggravating. So, so you know, I was convinced by Jung. It looked to me like his ideas about the relationship between dreams and mythology and drama and literature made sense to me. And the, and the, uh, and, and the relationship between that and art. I know this native carver, he's a Kwakwakawak guy, he's carved a bunch of wooden sculptures, totem poles and masks that I have in my house. And he's a very interesting person, not literate, not particularly literate, and really still steeped in this ancient 13,000 year old tradition. He's an original language speaker. And um, the fact that he isn't literate has sort of left him with the mind of someone who's pre-literate. And pre-literate people aren't stupid, they're just not literate, so their brains are organized differently in many ways. And I've asked him about his, his, his intuition for his carvings. And he's told me that he dreams, like you've seen the Haida masks, you know what they look like. Well, his people are, are closely related to the Haida, so it's the same kind of style. He said he dreams in those animals and, and to remember his dreams, and he also, talks to his grandparents who taught him how to carve in his dreams. Quite often, if he runs into a problem with carving, his grandparents will come and he'll talk to them. But he sees that the creatures that he's going to carve living in an animated sense in his, in his imagination. I mean, it's not that difficult. First of all, I have no reason to disbelieve him. He's a very, very straightforward person. And he doesn't have the motivation or the guile, I would say, in some sense, to invent a story like that. There's just no reason he would possibly do it. I don't think he's told that many people about it. He thinks it's kind of crazy, you know. said when he was a kid, he thought he was insane because he'd had those dreams all the time about these creatures and so forth. And so it wasn't something he was trumpeting. But I found it fascinating because I can see in him part of the manifestation of this unbroken tradition. We have no idea how traditions like that are really passed along for thousands and thousands of years, right? Part of it's oral and memory part of it's acted out and dramatized, and then part of it's going to be imaginative. And people who aren't literate, they store information quite differently than we do. We don't remember anything. It's all written down in books. Right? But if you're from an oral culture, especially if you're trained in that way, you have all of that information at hand, both so you can speak it, you can tell the stories, and you really know them. And you know, modern people don't really know what that's like anymore. I doubt if there's more than maybe two of you in the audience that could spout from memory like a 30-line poem. You know, when poetry was written so that people could do that. 
that, that, that's why we have that form is so that people could remember it and, and have it with them. And we don't do any of that anymore. This is a very important point. Um, so like uh, the in, in Iceland and in the Norse traditions, they have um, alliterative poetry. It's not rhyming poetry. Um, because they didn't write anything down. They, they used alliteration, which is, you know, you, um, you have the same first letter for certain sounds. Um, and this is also true of medieval literature, especially for, um, uh, what's his name? I can't remember, but he wrote a, a whole series of medieval poems that were rent, uh, eventually written down, but, you know, like bottles and bags and beer and all those words, and and if you have that sort of sound that goes with it, it, it makes memorization easier. Um, you know, and you you do these kind of memory tricks for school. Like I remember uh, to remember all the different um, declinations. I think it is of the, of the nouns and things like that for Latin. It was uh, nominative, genitive, dative. Abli uh, avocative, ablative, and vocative. And so we came up with this sort of memory thing of no good dogs after aardvarks vote. So, you know, it's those, those little games that we play with, each, with ourselves in order to remember things. And ancient cultures did this all the time. And they made sure that, you know, these stories um, you know, the, you could, you could remember the entire thing, uh, just because of the way that things sounded and the way that, you know, one word was chosen over the next, you know, to continue the poetry along. And, and a lot of the Icelandic myths and sagas, the Eddas and sagas and things like that, they thought were complete fantasy until, you know, archeology span went and dug up some of the graves. And one of the, um, most impressive ones was about this guy who took an actual ax to the head and lived. Um, and they had stories about him, about how when he was older, you know, he had gone blind because his eyes had actually been sealed shut and his head was so heavy that he couldn't hold it up. His neck became unable to hold it up. And uh, they did the archeology, span they found his grave found out, yes, this guy actually had taken an ax blow to the head. And what he had is he had a degenerative disease that made the bones in his head grow thicker and thicker and thicker. So he could take an ax blow to the head and it didn't split his skull, but they could see that there was the actual ax wound there. And um, as he grew older, you know, the bones in his eyes grew larger and larger and larger until he became blind because those, those bones had sealed over his eyes. And the weight of his skull was such that he couldn't hold it up anymore. But this guy was a, an incredible chieftain among the Icelandic. Um, so, and like the, the same thing with the, um, the Greek myths. They thought that Agamemnon was a, a, a complete fabrication and a story until they actually were able to find the grave of Ag Agamemnon and, you know, the, the facial shield, the death mask, as it were. Um, and the city of Troy, they thought the city of Troy was a myth until they found it. And then they found seven more city of Troys underneath the original, you know, the last city of Troy. So a lot of these stories actually have, you know, real occurrences in the past where these things happened. Um, and they were such phenomenal stories. They were such, you know, unbelievable stories that people passed them on and passed them on and passed them on until... You know, it's so far separated from the original story that people are like, ah, oh, that never happened. No, there's no way until, you know, you do a little archaeology, dig it up and find out, oh, holy cow, that actually happened. There actually was a city of Troy. There actually was an Agamemnon. There actually was this Thornstein or whatever his name was, who, who uh, Gunder, I don't know. But it was printed up in National Geographic, you know, that they actually found this guy's skull. Um, and that this whole story was real. So, but yeah, the alliterative literature uh, was one way that we used to remember these things. And then later on rhyme, but rhyme isn't really as useful 
Um, there's a lot more memorization that goes into rhyming things uh, as opposed to, you know, because you don't remember the first half of the line, you just remember the last word at the end. And so you've got to, you know, string it all together. But alliterative literature is actually much more useful in an oral tradition, a non-written tradition than uh, other things. Um, and then uh, Logic says, yeah, I don't know what it is. Maybe a lot to do with the way he can articulate. Well, and that's, that's what's so wonderful about Peterson is that not only can he take really, really complex ideas and simplify them, but he does it in a way that it's like a conversation where he anticipates our question. You know, like, what, you know, why would anybody study this stuff? You know, what's the point? Where, where's this coming from? And he answers that question, and then he anticipates what the next question is going to be, and he says it. So it's like a full conversation on stage, but we don't ever have to verbalize it. So that was that was the point of, of my um, comment on that. But we'll go ahead and continue. So, Anyways, back to Jung. Jung was a great believer in the dream, and I noted that Dreams will tell you things that you don't know. And then I thought, well, how the hell can that be? How that in the world can something you think of tell you something you don't know? How does that make any sense? First of all, why don't you understand it? Why does it have to come forth in the form of the dream? It's like you're not, there's something going on inside you that you don't control, right? The dream happens to you just like life happens to you. I mean, there is the odd lucid dreamer who can, you know, apply a certain amount of conscious control, but most of the time it's you're laying there asleep and this crazy complicated world manifests itself inside you and you don't know how, you could, you can't do it when you're awake and you don't know what it means. It's like, what the hell is going on? And that's one of the things that's so damn frightening about the psychoanalysts because you get this both from Freud and Jung, you really start to understand that there are things inside you that are happening that control you instead of the other way around. You know, he's a bit of reciprocal control, but there's manifestations of spirits, so to speak, inside you that determine the manner in which you walk through life, and you don't control it. And what does? Is it random? You know, there are people who have claimed that dreams are mere, merely the consequence of random neuronal firing, which is a theory I think is absolutely absurd because there's nothing random about dreams. You know, they're very, very structured and, and very, very complex. And they're not like snow on a television screen or, or static on a radio. Like, those things are complicated. And, and then also I've seen so often that people have very coherent dreams that have a perfect narrative structure. You know, they're fully developed in some sense. And so that just doesn't, I, that theory just doesn't go anywhere with me. I just can't see that as useful at all. And... So, so I'm more likely to take the phenomena seriously and say, well, there's something to dreams. Well, you dream of the future, and then you try to make it into a reality. That seems to be an important thing. You know, or maybe you dream up a nightmare and try to make that into a reality, because people do that too if they're hell-bent on revenge, for example, and full of hatred and resentment. I mean, that manifests itself in terrible fantasies. You know, those are dreams, then people go act them out. These things are powerful. You know, and whole nations can get caught up in collective dreams. That's what happened to the Nazis. That's what happened to Nazi Germany in the 1930s. It was absolutely remarkable, amazing, horrific, destructive spectacle. And the same thing happened in the Soviet Union. The same thing happened in China. Like, we have to take these things seriously, you know, and try to understand what's going on. So Jung believed that the dream could contain more information than was yet articulated. You think... Artists do the same thing, you know, like people go to museums and they look at paintings, Renaissance paintings or modern paintings, and they don't exactly know why they're there. You know, I, I was in this room in, in New York, I don't remember which museum, but it, had, it was a room full of Renaissance art, you know, great painters, the, the greatest painters, and thought maybe that room was worth a billion dollars or something outrageous because there's like 20 paintings in there, you know, so priceless. And the first thing is, well, why are those paintings worth so much? And why is there a museum in the biggest city in the world devoted to them? And why do people from all over the world come and look at them? What the hell are those people doing? One of them was of the Assumption of Mary, you know, beautifully painted, absolutely glowing work of art. And there's like 20 people standing in front of it looking at it and think, 
what are those people up to? You know, they don't know. Why did they make a pilgrimage to New York to come and look at that painting? It's not like they know. Why is it worth so much? I mean, I know there's a status element to it too, but that begs the question. Why do those items become such high status items? What is it about them that's so absolutely remarkable? Well, we're strange creatures. That's the so truth. I was trying to figure out in part, well, where did the information that's in the dream come from? It has to come from somewhere, and you could think about it as a revelation, you know, because it's, it's like it springs out of the void, and it's new knowledge, and it's a revelation. You didn't produce it. It just, it just appears. But that's, see, one of the things I want to do with this series is, like, I'm scientifically minded, and I'm quite a rational person, and I like to have an explanation for things that's rational and empirical before I look for any other kind of explanation. And I don't want to say that everything that's associated with divinity can be reduced in some manner to biology or to an evolutionary history or anything like that. But insofar as it's possible to do that reduction, I'm going to do that. And I'm going to leave the other phenomena floating in the air because they can't be pinned down. And in that category, I would put the category of mystical or religious experience, which we don't understand at all. So... Artists observe one another. They observe people and they represent what they see and they transmit the message of what they see to us and they teach us to see. And we don't necessarily know what it is that we're learning from them. But we're learning something, or at least we're acting like we're learning something. We go to movies, we watch stories, we, 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 we immerse ourselves in fiction constantly. That's an artistic production. And for many people, the world of the arts is a living world. And that's particularly true if you're a creative person. And it's the creative, artistic people that do move the knowledge of humanity forward. And they do that with their artistic productions first. They're on the edge. And the dancers do that. And the poets do that. And the visual artists do that. And the musicians do that. And we're not sure what they're doing. Like, we're not sure what musicians are doing. What the hell are they doing? Why do you like music? You know, it gives you a deep intimation of the significance of things. And no one questions it. You go to a concert, you're thrilled. It's a quasi-religious experience, particularly if the people really get themselves together and get the crowd moving. You know, there's something incredibly intense about it. It makes no sense whatsoever. It's, it's not an easy thing to understand. Music is deeply patterned and, I, and, and patterned in layers, and I think that has something to do with it because re reality is patterned and deeply patterned in layers. And so I think music is representing reality in some fundamental way and that we get into the sway of that and sort of participate in being, and that's part of what makes it such an uplifting experience. But we don't really know that's what we're doing. We just go do it, and 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 it's nourishing for people, right? I mean, the young people in particular, lots of them live for music. It's where they derive all their meaning, their cultural identity. Everything that's nourishing comes from their affiliation with their music. It's part of their cultural identity. So that's an amazing thing. What's even more amazing is that it's not just humans that respond to music, you know, animals respond to music as well. Um, that whole pattern of, you know, we were talking about in the book yesterday, how a bird's song, if you record it and play it back to them, they'll start dive bombing you and, you know, the little wren and stuff like that, you know, and, and you know, that music soothes the savage beast, that old saying. Um, and you know, that, that, that patterning of sound, because sound doesn't just come to your ears. It resonates through your entire body. You know, deaf people can, deaf people love concerts because they're loud enough that they can feel the music in their bodies. You know, if you, if you ever go to a, a, a party that's filled with deaf people, the music is cranked to 11 because that's how they can experience music is, is by actually feeling it. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, and, it, and it's not just our species, it's transspecial, this, this enjoyment of music. Um, and, it, and it's quite, you know, sad that music has, has uh, you know, digressed into this four chord sort of experience where where you know all the music cranked out these days is just based on these four chords because those are all the pop hits and it's all based around money and everything like that and that's why a lot of kids these days get into the underground music scene 
you know, in the independent music scene and stuff like that. So uh, <laughs> this one goes to 11. Yeah. <laughs> um, Different Gnome says, I still do. I recently discovered Tom McDonald and I find myself deriving kinship brotherhood from it. Yeah, exactly. And then Taylor said, that's so true. And the mood can determine what style you listen to or soothing for sleep. Yeah. Um, we actually did a role-playing game where we were um, playing uh, the darker side of the monster scene. And um, our afterwards, you know, we were still caught up in that mood of, you know, the dark and the sinister and everything like that. And um, the, the game master put on, what was it? Um, they might be giants, you know, which is very happy, cheerful music sort of stuff. And none of us wanted to listen to that. We, we were like, put on something else, put on something else. He's like, no, we're going to listen to this because we'd all gotten into this headspace, the group of us. And, you know, we, we, we discovered that, you know, the, the music didn't fit our mood, but as we listened to the music, it changed our mood out of that dark, heavy space into one that was more light. And it's just absolutely phenomenal. Uh, the magic of sound as it were. So the question still remains, where does the information in dreams come from? Yeah. And I think what it, the, where it comes from is that we watch the patterns that everyone acts out. We, we've watched that forever and we've got some representations of those patterns. That's part of our cultural history. That's what's embedded in stories in fictional accounts of the story between good and evil, the bad guy and the good guy, and the romance. You know, these are these are canonical patterns of being for people, and, and they deeply affect us because they represent what it is that we will act out in the world. And then we flesh that out with the individual information we have about ourselves and other people. And so it's like there's a there's a there's waves of, of behavioral patterns that manifest themselves in the crowd across time. The great dramas are played on the crowd across time. And the artists watch that and, and they get intimations of what that is and they write it down and they tell us and then we're a little clearer about what we're up to. You know, like a great dramatist like Shakespeare, let's say, is, we know that what he wrote is fiction and then we say, well, fiction isn't true. But then you think, well, wait a minute, maybe it's true like numbers are true. You know, numbers are an abstraction from the underlying reality, but no one in their right mind would really think numbers aren't true. You could even make a case that the numbers are more real than the things that they represent, right? Because the abstraction is so insanely powerful. Once you have mathematics, you're just deadly. You can move the world with mathematics. And so it's not obvious that the abstraction is less real than the, than the, than, than the more concrete reality. And, you and that's an incredible point. I mean, this is something that, that – this is a point that I make to atheists all the time. You know, they're, they're like – you know, it, it's not rational. It's da, 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 da. you know, why would you believe in this fiction? And it's like, we believe stuff from fiction all the time, all the time. You know, it, I mean, how many fictional stories do you read? How did you go and watch movies? These things have meaning to us. Why? Because there are truths expressed within them, just like numbers aren't real. Like you can't go out and you can't hold the number two. It just doesn't work. You know, there is no number two, but two is incredibly real and incredibly rational. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, rationality and fiction that, you know, a lot of the atheists don't even recognize, you know, they, they think that science and, and mathematics and all of that is the end all be all. And it's like, yeah, but have you ever even thought about what mathematics is? You know, none of that is real. You know, but it expresses truths that exist in reality. So I need to pause it for a quick second because I need to go to the bathroom and you all don't need to hear my toilet. So I will be right back. <laughs>
All right, sorry about that. Uh, let us go back to Mr. Peterson. You take a work of fiction like Hamlet, and you think, well, is that, it's, it's not true because it's fiction, but then you think, wait a minute, what kind of explanation is that? Maybe it's more true than nonfiction because it takes what the story that needs to be told about you and the story that needs to be told about you and you and you and you and abstracts that out and says, look, here's something that's a key part of the human experience as such, right? So it's, it's an abstraction from this underlying noisy substrate and, and people are affected by it because they see that the thing that's represented is part of the pattern of their being. That's the right way to think about it. And then with these old stories, these ancient stories, it seems to me like that process has been occurring for thousands of years. It's like we watched ourselves and we extracted out some stories. We imitated each other and we represented that in drama. And then we distilled the drama and we got a representation of the distillation. And then we did it again. And at the end of that process, it took God only knows how long. I think some of these stories... They've, they've traced fairy tales back 10,000 years, some fairy tales, in relatively unchanged form. And it certainly seems to me that the archaeological evidence, for example, suggests that the really old stories that, that, that the Bible begins with are at least that old and likely embedded in a prehistory that's far older than that. You might think, well, how can you be so sure? And the answer to that in part is that cultures that don't change, like the ancient cultures, right? They didn't change as fast as this. They stay the same. That's the answer. So they call, they keep their information moving generation to generation. That's how they stay the same. And so we know, again, in the archaeological record, there are records of rituals that have remained relatively unbroken for up to 20,000 years. That's incredible. In caves in Japan that were set up for a particular kind of bear worship that was also characteristic of Western Europe. So these things can last for very long periods of time. Yeah, 20,000 years. We're watching each other act in the world. And then the question is, well, how long have we been watching each other? And the answer to that, in some sense, is, well, as long as there's been creatures with nervous systems. And that's a long time. You know, that's some hundreds of millions of years, perhaps longer than that. We've been watching each other, trying to figure out what we're up to across that entire span of time. Some of that knowledge is built right into our bodies, which is why we can dance with each other, for example, right? Because understanding isn't just something that you that you have as an abstraction. It's something that you act out. You know? That's what children are doing when they're learning to rough and tumble plays. They're learning to integrate their body with the body of someone else in a harmonious way, learning to cooperate and compete. And that's all instantiated right into their body. It's not abstract knowledge. They don't know that they're doing that. They're just doing it. And so we can even use our body as a representational platform. So we've been studying each other for a long time, abstracting out what is it that we're up to? And that's, that, that's what is it we're up to? What should we be up to? That's even a more fundamental question. If you're going to live in the world and you're going to do it properly, what does properly mean? And how is it that you might go about that? Well, it's the right question, right? It's what everyone wants to know. How do you live in the world? Not what is the world made of? It's not the same question. How do you live in the world? It's the eternal question of human beings. And I guess we're the only species that has ever really asked that question because all the other animals, they just go and do whatever they do, mm -hmm. not us. It's a question for us. We've had to, we have to become aware of it. We have to be able to speak it. God only knows why, but that seems to be the situation. So we act, that acting is shaped by the world, that acting is shaped by society into something that we don't understand, but that we can model, that we can model. We model it in our stories, we model it with our bodies. And that's where the dream gets its information. The dream is part of the process that's watching everything and then trying to formulate it and trying to say, well, trying to get the signal out from the noise and to portray it in dramatic form because a dream is a little drama. And then you get the chance to talk about what that dream is. And then you have, it, you have something like articulated knowledge at that point. And so the Bible, I would say, is, is it's sort of, it exists in that space that's half into the dream and half into articulated knowledge. It's something like that. And going into it to find out what the stories are about and what, what it can aid our self-understanding. And then the other issue is, is that if, 
Michu was correct, and if Dostoevsky or Jung was correct, and Dostoevsky as well, without the cornerstone that that understanding provides, we're lost. And that's not good, because then we're susceptible to psychic pathology. That's psychological pathology. You know, people who are ad adamant, anti-religious thinkers seem to believe that if we abandon our immersement in the underlying dream that we'd all instantly become rationalists like Descartes or Bacon, or, you know, intelligent, clear thinking, rational, scientific people. And I don't believe that for a moment because I don't think there's any evidence for it. I think we would become so irrational so rapidly that the weirdest mysteries of Catholicism would seem positively rational by contrast. And I think that's already happening. So, And that, that, that's very, very true. I mean, that's why a lot of these leftists and stuff like that, they are going to what they call the old religions and stuff like that. Um, they're going to paganism. They're going to uh, other forms of um, mysticism and various things like that because we are all rooted in a dream. Um, you know, we, we don't see 100% with our eyes, we see what we focus on. Um, you know, we yeah, birds are a lot better at memorizing maps than we are um, because that's how they they function. You know, and um, there are a lot of um, even in the military use of pigeons. You know, to to remember landscapes and things like that. Um, and the pigeons know better than we do because their, their entire brain is constructed towards remembering things in flight. They don't have maps to, to write things down. So, you know, their eyesight is a lot keener and their memorization of what they see is a lot keener than what we experience. We experience reality as a dream, really. Um, and that's why, you know, the TV becomes can become so immersive and things like that. You can get so lost in a story that the rest of the world, the room you're in, even the people next to you can melt away completely when you're watching a movie and it just becomes you in the story. Um, and so, and that's, that's very left brain and, and right brain sort of stuff. The kind of uh, studies that they've done because like, there's, there's a large part of our brain that isn't verbal. There's only like this small section in the center of the brain and it bridges both sides. Um, but it's our language center. And when that not gets knocked out, you know, reading disappears, words disappear. Um, you know, talking can become difficult. And I've, I've experienced this with my migraines. And you realize that we think in pictures um, and, and it's, it's, scenes tied to emotions and other things like that. You know, it's not just, um, you know, this whole rational thought thing. We can't just abandon the dream and think we can be fully rational because we don't understand that it's our rational mind actually explains the non verbal part of our brain. Um, I think I'll, I'll, uh, key you guys in there's a um a ted talk called the stroke of insight uh where this neuroscientist um was able to uh experience a stroke from the inside um and it's it's absolutely fascinating what happened to her and and she has a question at the beginning and she doesn't realize that she answers her own question as a result of the talk but she does um, and she loses her verbal centers and stuff like that. And she loses her ability to even tell the difference between the molecules in her arm and the molecules in the wall. You know, all of these things become very, very fuzzy to her. But she's able to remember the whole thing because we think in stories. We think in dreams. Um, and, and that's why we're a storytelling species. Um, and, and that's why you can't just divorce the, the dream from the rational and, and turn us into perfectly rational beings. That's not going to happen. Our brains aren't even built that way. So this idea that we can do it is just absolutely insane, um, which is why you get insane sort of results when you try and do that. So...
Okay. So this is the idea, essentially, you know, that you have the unknown world. That, that's just what you don't know at all. That's, that's the outside. That's the ocean that surrounds the island that you inhabit, something like that. It's chaos itself. And then you act in that world, and you act in ways you don't understand. There's more to your actions than you can understand. One of the things Jung said, I love this when I first understood it, he said, everybody acts out a myth, but very few people know what their myth is. And you should know what your myth is because it might be a tragedy. Oh, yeah. Maybe you don't want it to be. And that's really worth thinking because thinking about because you're you have a pattern of behavior that characterizes you. you no know, one God only knows where you got it. Partly it's biological, partly it's from your parents, it's it's your unconscious assumptions, it's the way the philosophy of your society has shaped you, and it's it's aimed, it's aiming you somewhere. Well, is it aiming you somewhere you want to go? That's a good question. That's part of self-realization, you know. We know we don't understand our actions. That's almost every argument you have with someone is about that. It's like, why did you do that? You come up with some half-baked reasons why you did it. You're flailing around in the darkness, you know, you try to give an account for yourself, but you can only do it partially. It's very, very difficult because you're, you're, you're a complicated animal with the, the beginnings of an articulated mind, something like that. And, you're just way more than you can handle and and all right so you act things out right you, you act things out and that's a kind of competence and then you imagine what you act out and you imagine what everyone else acts out and so there's a tremendous amount of information in your action and then that information is translated up into the dream and into art into mythology and literature and there's a tremendous amount of information in that and then some of that is translated into articulated thought. And I'll give you a quick example of something like that. I think this is partly what happens in Exodus when Moses comes up with the law. You know, he's wandering around with the Israelites forever in the desert. And they're, they're like going left and going right and worshiping idols and like having a hell of a time. And, um, you know, getting rebellious. And Moses goes up in the mountain and he has this tremendous revelation sort of in the sight of God. And it illuminates him and he comes down with the law think, well, you know, Moses acted as a judge. I know this is a mythological story. Moses acted as a judge in the desert. He was continually mediating between people who were having problems, constantly trying to keep peace. And so what are you doing when you're trying to keep peace? Is you're trying to understand what peace is, right? You have to apply the principles. Well, what are the principles? Well, you don't know. The principles are whatever satisfies people enough to make peace. And maybe you do that 10,000 times, and then you get some sense of, oh, here's the principles that bring peace. And then one day it blasts into your consciousness like, like a revelation. Here's the rules that we're already acting out. Well, that's the Ten Commandments. It's, they're there to begin with. And Moses comes forward and says, look, this is already basically what we're doing, but now it's codified, right? And like, that's all a historical process that's condensed into a single story. But obviously that happened because we have written law, right? And that emerged in, in good legal systems. That emerges from the bottom up. That's English common law is exactly like that, right? It's single decisions that are predicated on principles that are then, then articulated and made into the body of law. And the body of law is something you act out. That's why it's a body of law. If you're a good citizen, you act out the body of law. And the body of law has principles. Okay, so the question is, there's principles that guide our behavior. What are those principles? Well, I think when you, if, you're, if you want the initial answer of what the ar archaic Israelites meant by God, that's something like what they meant. Now, it's not a good enough explanation, but look, imagine that, you, that, you have a, that you're a chimpanzee and you have a powerful... Dominant figure at the pinnacle of your society that that represents power now more than that because it's not sheer physical prowess that keeps a chimp at the top of the hierarchy. It's much more complicated than that. But you could say, well, there's there's a principle that the dominant person manifests, and then you might say, well, that principle shines forth even more brightly if you know ten people who are dominant, powerful. Then you can extract out what dominance means. From that, you can extract out what power means from that, and then you can divorce the concept from the people. And we had to do that at some point because we can say power, 
in a human context, and we can imagine what that means, but it's divorced from any specific manifestation of power. Well, how the hell did we do that? Like, that's so complicated. When, if you're a chimp, the power is in another chimp. It's not some damn abstraction. Well, so the, so the question is, think, think about it. We're, we're in these hierarchies, many of them across centuries. We're trying to figure out what the guiding principle is. We're trying to extract out the core of the guiding principle. And we turn that into a representation of a pattern of being. Well, it's, it's something like that. That's God. It's an abstracted ideal. And it's, it's, it's put in personified form, it manifests itself in personified form, but that, that's okay because what we're trying to get at is the, in some sense, the essence of what it means to be a properly functioning and properly, properly functioning, properly social and properly competent individual. We're trying to figure out what that means. You need a, an embodiment, you need an ideal that's abstract and that you could act out that would enable you to understand what that means. And that's what we've been driving at. So that's the first hypothesis in some sense. I'm going to go over some of the some of the attributes of this abstracted ideal that we formalized as God, but that's the first sort of hypothesis is that a philosophical or moral ideal manifests itself first as a concrete pattern of behavior that's characteristic of a single individual. And then it's a set of individuals. And then it's an abstraction from that set. And then you have the abstraction, it's so important. So here's a political implication, for example. One of the debates, we might say, between early Christianity and the late Roman Empire was whether or not an emperor could be God, literally, right? To be deified, to, put in a, to be put in a temple and you can see why that might happen, because that's someone at the pinnacle of a very steep hierarchy who has a tremendous amount of power and influence. But the Christian response to that was, never confuse the specific sovereign with the principle of sovereignty itself. That's mm -hmm. brilliant. It's, you see how difficult it is to come up with an idea like that, so that even the person who has the power is actually subordinate to something else, subordinate to... Uh, Let's call it a divine principle, for lack of a better word. So that even the king himself is subordinate to the principle. And we still believe that because we believe that our president, our prime minister, is subordinate to the damn law, whatever the body of law, right? There's a principle inside that that even the leader is subordinate to. And without that, you could argue you can't even have a civilized society because your, your leader immediately turns into something that's transcendent and all-powerful, and I mean, that's certainly what happened in the Soviet Union and what happened in Maoist China and what happened in Nazi Germany, because there was nothing for the powerful to subordinate themselves to. You're supposed to be subordinate to God. So what does that mean? Well, we're going to tear that idea apart, but partly what it means is that you're subordinate, even if you're sovereign, to the principle of sovereignty itself. And then the question is, what the hell is the principle of sovereignty? And I could say we have been working that out for a very long period of time. And so that's one of the things that we'll talk about because the ancient Mesopotamians and the ancient Egyptians had some very interesting, dramatic ideas about that. So, And that's one of the reasons that we get so upset as a culture when our leaders don't subordinate themselves to the law. You know, when they, they say one rule for me and one rule for thee. You know, uh, this whole thing going on with COVID and governors and, you know, mayors and other things like that, not, um, you know, following their own rules is we really do have this abstracted idea of there is a power greater than the individual to which we must all subordinate ourselves to. And if, and if leaders don't, you know, we want their heads. Because, you know, <laughs> who are you? You know, who died and made you God for you to be able to say, no, I don't have to follow this rule. Everybody else does. You know, it's, it's that, that is extremely offensive to us as a culture, as a civilization, that sort of thing. Um, whereas, you know, with, in Maoist China, um, you know, Xi can do no wrong. He is the ultimate power. And therefore, 
he can make one rule for himself and one rule for all the rest of China. Um, so before I, I, I noticed a few people have dropped out and come back in, but go ahead and smash that like button. Um, and um, yeah, we've got about 10 minutes left. So uh, uh, get any questions in you have now and we'll stop it for like maybe the last five minutes for discussion. But I, I really thought that was interesting, you know, that, that Christianity is one of the first inklings that we get that, you know, and, and Judaism before it, you know, the idea that, you know, the king is still subject to the will of God, uh, whatever that is. Uh, and that, you know, we, we still very much have that as part of our culture today. So. Just for example, very briefly, there was a, a deity known as Marduk. And Marduk, he was a Mesopotamian deity. And imagine this is sort of what happened, is that as an empire grew out of the post-Ice Age age, say 15,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, all these tribes came together. And these tribes each had their own deity, their own image of the ideal. But then they started to occupy the same territory, right? And so then... One tribe had God A and one tribe had God B and you know, they, one could wipe the other one out and then it would just be God A who wins. But that's not so good because, well, maybe you want to trade with those people or maybe you don't want to lose half your population in a war, something like that. So then you have to have an argument about whose God is going to take priority, which ideal is going to take priority. And what seems to happen is that's represented in mythology as a battle of the gods in sort of celestial space. But... From a practical perspective, it's more like an ongoing dialogue. You believe this, I believe this. You believe that, I believe this. How are we going to meld that together? So you take God A and you take God B, and maybe what you do is extract God C from them. And you say, well, God C now has the attributes of A and B. And then some other tribes come in, and then C takes them over too. And so you get, like with Marduk, for example, he has a multitude of names, 50 different names. Well, those are names at least in part, of the subordinate gods that represented the tribes that came together to make the civilization. That's part of the process by which that abstracted ideal is abstracted. You think this is important, and it works because your tribe's alive, and you think this is important, and it works because your tribe is alive. And so we'll take the best of both if we can manage it and ex extract out something that's even more abstract that covers both of us if we can do it. And one of the things that's really interesting about Marduk, I'll just give you a couple of of his features, but he has eyes all the way around his head. He's elected by all the other gods to be king god, so that's the first thing. That's quite cool. And they elect him because they're, they're facing a terrible threat, sort of like a flood and a monster combined, something like that. And Marduk basically says that if they elect him top god, then he'll go out and stop the flood monster, and, and, and they won't all get wiped out. It's a serious threat. It's chaos itself making its comeback, and so all the gods agree. And Marduk is a new manifestation. He's got eyes all the way around his head, and he speaks magic words. And then he also goes out, and when he fights, he fights this deity called Tiamat. And, and you need to know that because the word Tiamat is associated with the word Tehom, T-E-H-O-M. And Tehom is the chaos that God makes order out of at the beginning of time in Genesis. So it's linked very tightly to this story. And Marduk, with his eyes and his capacity to speak magic words, goes out to confront Tiamat, who's like a watery sea dragon, something like that. Uh, it's a classic, it's a classic St. George story, go out and, and wreak havoc on the dragon. He cuts her into pieces, and he makes the world out of her pieces, and that's the world that human beings live in, and the Mesopotamian emperor acted out Marduk. He was allowed to be emperor insofar as he was a good Marduk, and so that meant that he had eyes all the way around his head, and he could speak magic, you could speak properly. And so that we're starting to understand there at that point the essence of leadership, right? Because what's leadership? It's the capacity to see what the hell's in front of your face and maybe in every direction, and then the capacity to use your language properly in a transformative manner and to transform chaos into order. And God only know how, knows how long it took the Mesopotamians to figure that out, and the best they could do is dramatize it, but it's staggeringly brilliant. No, it's, it's by no means obvious. And this chaos, this chaos is a very strange thing. 
This is the chaos that God wrestled with at the beginning of time. Chaos is what, it's, it's half psychological and half real. There's no other way to really describe it. The chaos is what you encounter when you're thrown into deep confusion, right? When your world falls apart, when, when you encounter something that blows you into pieces, when your dreams die, when you're betrayed, it's the chaos that emerges. And the chaos is everything at once, and it's too much for you, and that's for sure. And it pulls you down into the underworld, and all, that's where the dragons are, and all you've got at that point is your capacity to bloody well keep your eyes open and to speak as carefully and clearly as you can. And maybe if you're lucky, you'll get through it that way and come out the other side. And it's taken people a very long time to figure that out. And it looks to me like the idea is erected on the platform of our ancient ancestors, maybe tens of millions of years ago, because we seem to represent that which disturbs us deeply using the same system that we use to represent like serpentile, serpentile or other carnivorous predators. And it, you know, we're biological creatures, right? So when we've formulated our capacity to abstract, our strange capacity to abstract and use language, we still have all those underlying systems that were there when we were only animals. And we have to use those systems there. They're part of the emotional and motivational architecture of our thinking. And part of the reason we can demonize our enemies who upset our axioms is because we perceive them as if they're carnivorous predators. We do it with the same system. And that's chaos itself, the thing that always threatens us, right? The snakes that came to the trees when we lived in them like 60 million years ago. It's the same damn systems. So Lamarck's story is partly the story of using attention and language to confront those things that most threaten us. And some of those things are real, real world threats, but some of them are psychological threats, which are just as profound, but far more abstract. We, but we use the same systems to represent them. That's why you freeze if you're frightened, right? You're a prey animal. You're like a rabbit. You've seen us. You've seen something that's going to eat you. You freeze, and that way you're paralyzed. You're turned to stone, which is what you do when you see a Medusa with a head full of snakes, right? You're turned to stone. You're paralyzed, and the reason you do that is because you're using the predator detection system to protect yourself. Your heart rate goes way up, and you get ready to move. All right, I'm going to stop it there. Um, yeah, that's why our leadership is failing because they are so out of touch with society and don't know what we really want or need to survive in America. Absolutely. Absolutely. And they've forgotten the underlying principle of power. And that is you can't abuse power. Uh, every time that power was, you know, abused throughout history, uh, you know, the, the, everybody else below them, the, the, you know, you've, you've got this pyramid of power and they're at the pinnacle and they think that, you know, they are an incarnation of God and therefore can do no wrong. But they forget that they are supported by the substrate below them. And so if you abuse the principles of power, um, you know, the bottom falls out of the whole society. So um, but we've only got a few minutes left. I thought there was a good place to pause because we're about an hour of the way into this. This whole thing is two hours and 38 minutes, but there's a question and answer uh, at the end that I'm probably going to skip um, just because I, I want to keep to the meat of this. Um, if you want to go and, and watch the question and answers, I'll let you know. But we've stopped pretty much at the hour mark of where uh, Peterson is in this lecture. But um, what do you guys think so far? I mean, we haven't even gotten into the Bible yet. You know, we're just we're just struggling with the the ideas of of how we even came up to conceptualize with a God. And um, Jordan Peterson does these really uh, interesting interviews that he the interviews were while he was doing this series. And um, he uh, in in those talks he talks about how the dragon is a representation of all the predators that we had as you know small marsupial animals uh that it's a cat snake bird because what are the three pr main predators and and there's actually a group of monkeys and there, there's like five different species of monkeys and they all move together as one tribe through the trees and they have um language 
Uh, they have different calls for what a bird is, uh, uh, you know, like a, a, a predatory bird, a hawk or something like that. And they have the same sort of word for uh, a snake. And then they also have one for like a cat. And so, you know, whenever any of the monkeys of, of these different species cry out, you know, bird, they all look up. Or if, or if it's snake, they all scuttle up into the tree and they start looking around and checking branches and stuff like that to see where the snake is. Same thing with a cat. They all scuttle up into the tree and they're all looking down on the ground, you know, to see where this cat is coming from. So a dragon is actually a combination of a cat, a snake, and a bird because those were our main predators back before we were human. Um, and that's why, you know, the dragon exists in every culture around the world, uh, and which is absolutely fascinating, you know, uh, going back to the idea of um, Joseph Campbell and the, uh, like the, the, the power of myth and the hero of a thousand faces, you know, anywhere where there was corn, there was a corn god, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, where there was rice, there was a rice god. Um, you know, these manifestations that we, we abstract out you know, what these creatures are like and stuff like that. So, um, but anyway, it is now seven o'clock and I don't know about you, but I'm a little, my brain is full. <laughs> so let me know if you have any questions um, and, we'll, and we'll discuss those things. But uh, of course, uh, remember to smash the like button um, and um, we will get back to this. Uh, next week. So uh, yeah, yeah, I had a wonderful time with this. I, I like listening to this with you all. And uh, I'm, I'm glad we got through an hour in two hours. So <laughs> Shaman says, I really like it all. It's great to hear from everyone and all the thinking involved too, as well as its application to our world that gets brought up too. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And doing this with a group of people is fantastic. You know, because you all have your individual thoughts and, and things like that that you bring to the table. So it makes it a much richer experience than if I were listening to this on my own. So Anna says, uh, another reason I'm glad to tag along with you. My brain definitely gets full from him. Yes. <laughs> so different known says, like people, we are one, like short, someone didn't pay their due. I don't know that I understand that. Oh, hey, Praying Mantis is here. She says, thank you, Pam. I just needed to be quiet and listen today. No problem. No problem. You know, feel feel free to lurk. You know, you don't have to contribute to the conversation if you don't want to. Um, so I'm hoping my mom is actually lurking in the background somewhere. Uh, Shaman says, thank you, Pam. So, yeah, I'm sorry I was late today. Computer troubles, whatever. But uh, yeah, Friday, uh, we're going to get back into the book, the book, the book, the book. And then uh, Saturday, we will continue with this uh, biblical lecture series and uh, we'll, we'll get through it all together. Yay! <laughs> so we got, oh my gosh, 11 watching and likes on this video. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. So awesome. I will see you all next week. You guys have a great week. Have a great Saturday night, Sunday morning, and I will see you all then. Mwah.